Buenos dias, mi amigos. Welcome to another episode of A Taboo Life, where everyone has a story to tell. I'm your host, Drew Franks, and I want to thank you guys again for listening. Come check out our website, atabulife.com, where you can read some interesting articles such as In and Out, Lubeck, Getting Drunk with the Mouse, and A Heart Filled with Wonderlust, a Rayward Wanderer's Tips for a Road Trip Across the U.S. It's a fun article for anyone that loves to travel. Among other content, there's other episodes of the podcast, some short stories, some poems, because I am that sappy, and a book with some self-publishing right now, which you can read for free on there, titled The Malediction of Lou and Glass. It is a story about a man who lost, not lost, but sold his soul to the devil, and he has a year to get it back. This book is for people who are fans of Neil Gaiman and Stephen King, because it's in that genre, the fantasy horror genre. So check it out for free on the website, atabulife.com. Speaking about art, today's guest is Mr. Philip McDaniel. He is the CEO and co-owner of St. Augustine Distillery, and obviously St. Augustine, Florida. We talk about art, the history of St. Augustine, and running a distillery business. It is a really insightful um, episode. Really fantastic guy to talk to. I did. I lived in Jacksonville for probably half my life, and I love to go to St. Augustine because it's only twenty minutes away from where I live. But there was so much history I didn't know about St. Augustine that Mister McDaniel was able to enlighten me on. But it's a great podcast for anyone who just loves art. Want to know how to start a business or someone's just a spirit connoisseur. So here's the episode and I hope you guys enjoy it. Live. All right, I want I want you to introduce yourself. I'm really excited about today's interview, and uh, I want you to introduce, introduce yourself to the audience. Thanks, Frank. Uh, my name is Phil McDaniel. I am the uh, co-founder and CEO of St. Augustine Distillery Company here in St. Augustine, Florida, which is uh, actually a really great company. Um, whenever I have friends come out of town, I take your um, I take them to your distillery for a tour. Awesome. So it's always nice to go to the the old ice house. Nice. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Yeah. So, um, let's get to business. How did you guys get started? You know, about uh, eight years ago, I has I was coming out of retirement and had an opportunity to uh, uh, go back to work. Um, I had um, been retired for about ten years. Mm-hmm. I had a sales and marketing company that I started when oh, I was okay. younger um, and sold that company and. I uh, was a full-time dad and was very involved in the community for uh, about 10 years, probably between 2001 and 2011, was on a number of community boards, did um, uh, a lot of ac- advocacy work for the arts uh, here in St. John's County, and helped get the Cultural Council up and running and ultimately uh, off the ground and um, helped uh, restore and rebuild the Beach at uh, the building at St. Augustine Beach Pier, what's now the dance company uh, building out there. We, we raised a bunch of money and wrote some grants and did some good things there. Um, helped build a couple of skate parks, including Treaty Park and uh, the Hamilton Up Church Park, which is over on uh, Davis Shores, and um, was involved in a number of you know good things. The amphitheater was another project I was really involved in, making sure that that was run by the county, and we had a good team doing that. So for about 10 years, I did um, a lot of kind of cool community service stuff and um at the uh when our youngest daughter was getting ready to go off to college i felt like it was an opportunity for me to kind of go back into the workforce um but during that time period frank i had so much fun and felt so good about doing good things for the community i wanted to 
uh, create a business that could continue to create social good on some level, uh, but also maybe, you know, become someplace where we could create some jobs and ultimately make some money and uh, look at a bunch of different business models. Um, no one had been doing uh, distilleries really in Florida. There was maybe two or three at that time in the state. And um, went out to Portland, uh, Oregon, went to uh, Seattle, went to, let's see, Louisville, Kentucky, went to upstate New York, <laughs> and visited a lot of distilleries, Denver, Colorado. And uh, long story short, thought that the, there would be a great opportunity, particularly here in Florida, uh, being such a big tourist state and having so much wonderful agriculture, knowing that distilling is very different than making beer and very different than mm-hmm. making wine. Um, if you can grow agriculture, whatever form that is, if it's fermentable, if it's a starch, right? So if it's a corn or a wheat or a barley, or in our case, a sugar cane can be used, citrus, those can all be used to, to either make alcohol or flavor it. Um, Florida had a lot of cool things going on from, from a farming standpoint. And we said, well, let's, let's just go ahead and do that. So I um, uh, bit the bullet and um, said, let's do this. And so that was that was the beginning. That was 2001. It was in, uh, 2011 that has been about eight nine years well, yeah and uh you guys have been successful since like i said i um i enjoy actually going to the store i enjoy buying the the gin i'm a gin drinker thanks yeah, and I'm, I'm not a beer drinker so i whenever i go out of town i to go visit um sightseeing i usually go to a winery or a mm-hmm. distillery oh cool um so you said you're in the arts um what kind of what kind of arts did you practice? Did you even practice any arts, or you just so, a connoisseur? I mean, yeah, no, no, no. I was so there's there's a couple things, right? So you're either an artist, mm-hmm. or you are uh, a connoisseur, an appreciator of art. Uh, somebody who likes to go to concerts or go to visual galleries and listen to or watch the art. Um, in my case, because my wife's a visual artist, and uh, all of our children um, sort of skewed towards the arts, um, our uh, all of our kids went to performing arts high schools. There's a great school in Jacksonville called Douglas Anderson oh, School yeah. of Arts. Um, and all four of our kids attended that school and, and got amazing educations up there. And I was so um, excited and uh, then aware of the role that a strong arts education can play in, in the raising and rearing of a child uh, from the skills that they learn, whether it's communication or writing or cooperating and working you know with other kids in the form of a dance recital or a play or um, the, the fact that students who um, study music generally get 50 to 70 points higher on their math SAT because math is really music mm-hmm. um, I while I play piano and guitar I certainly am not one to play in public but I love it it's very good for the soul for me I love playing it but I was more of an art advocate um, inherent i'm kind of a storyteller and a marketer and a promoter and and a salesperson in that regard and really what the arts needed at that time and it still does is somebody who can tell its story somebody who can go out and explain to um, civic leaders or um, uh, business leaders or educational leaders um, that you know arts are more than just this sort of pretty thing and a pretty painting it can Mm -hmm. really help serve to um, to better a community so um, I set about the task of um, doing several things. One was the um, working at that time when I had retired in 2001. I think I stopped working around 2002. A good friend had suggested I get involved in the Chamber's Leadership Program, uh, which is an annual program. They invite about 15 people from the community to join and become part of this leadership program. It's sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and you get to spend, I think it's a 10-month program, but you get to go around and see all the aspects of, of the county. You get to meet, you get to go visit all the schools, you get to see what the criminal justice system is like, mm. you get to spend a day on police and sheriff and public safety, you get to spend a day in arts, and you go see the local theater and all those things, amphitheater at that time, uh, you know, was fairly new. Um, you get to visit different parts of the county. So you go to Ponte Vedra and kind of see what that's like. You go out to Hastings in West Augustine, which is the polar opposite, right? You know, lots of wealth and affluence in Ponte Vedra, and there's quite a bit of poverty in the western part of the county and in West Augustine. And uh, so it really opens your eyes to the diversity of the county and what we have. Um, and it, it, it gave me 
um, such a, a, an a opening to work with a number of people in the community that then I was able to, with those connections that I made, um, start to understand um, you know, and, and, and tell what I saw was a growing importance and need for more arts in the community. And uh, it turned out that Dr. Joyner, uh, at the time, had just uh, started as our superintendent of schools. This was circa 2003, 2004, when Joe first came here from Orlando. And he was in the leadership class with me. So for eight successive, successive uh, months, I was able to get to know him. And uh, we struck up a great relationship. And um, I was able to help show uh, Dr. Joyner the role arts were playing in some other um, cities as a way to help improve um, kids because uh, not all kids are athletes, right? Not all mm-hmm. kids are going to be, um, you know, naturally adept at reading or writing or whatever. Some kids need another way to express themselves or another way to feel and build self-confidence. And, and, some, and some kids are uh, both. Some kids are artists and an athlete. And 100%. Correct. There's so much... Um, I mean, a person's so... I'm, not, I don't want to use the word flexible, but they're so... Uh, there's so many aspects to a person. You could be athletic, you could be a football sure. player, but you could also love to be write poetry. Absolutely. And uh, something you said earlier, I and I think it's starting to change now. Um, about the arts, whether it be music, painting, storytelling. Um, I remember when I was going to school in Jacksonville, that was kind of going downhill. Like you had to go be an athlete or student government or you did I was in NGROTC the Navy okay. thing but it was kind of sad that you didn't see that kind of post anymore even especially with uh, woodwork mm-hmm. yeah craftsmen you think about the util, you know the skill sets because if you, if you take a young you know young man or young woman and you say hey I'm going to teach you how to uh, safely work a saw. I'm going to teach you how to miter cut I'm going to give you all the skills that you need to start building things all of a sudden they have a skill set that they can use, um, you know, and go work in summer jobs. And more than anything else, I think, you know, when you're trying to help, you know, students or children particularly get from an adolescence to adulthood, so much of what they need more than anything else is somebody to believe in them mm-hmm. and also for them to believe in themselves. And one of the ways um, you do that is to, you know, expose them to a number of different things, including athletics, including woodworking, including mm-hmm. Uh, the arts, including dance, music, theater, uh, written word, all of those things um, will hopefully in some way, you know, allow a student to kind of discover themselves and find out, you know, what they like to do. Um, And in turn, maybe if they find out that they're good at something, then they'll start to believe in themselves more. And, you know, the most successful people in the world, generally speaking, are ones who, you know, have a, a, a pretty good level of confidence that we're someone that they know that they looked up to believed in them. So for, um, for me, and, you know, that's not to say the only way, but for me personally, um, I saw the role that arts was playing in my children, and I wanted other kids to have access to that here in St. John's County because we were commuting to Jacksonville <laughs> every day from St. Augustine. We put a lot of that's miles on those vans. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of, a lot of uh, driving, but it was certainly worth it in the end. And at the end of the day, uh, during part of that 10-year period, I spent um, really advocating for arts in schools, and I also... Uh, worked with the county to let them know that arts and culture played a role um, in improving the guest experience here in St. Augustine. So when people come, they could learn about the history that we have here, whether it's Castillo or Leitner Museum or Flagler College, which used to be, obviously, the Hotel Ponce. And it's a beautiful office. college, too. What's that? It's a beautiful ar- college, architecture-wise. Spectacular. And that architecture came um, because Henry Flagler, who was really the founder uh, the Florida East Coast Railway. He was the founder of Saint. Well, was the founder of Saint Augustine. But he certainly was a, a big economic developer in the late, uh, you know, nineteenth uh, century. He um, he was uh, he was really key to uh, helping uh, develop this uh, this community. And he built the hotel as a as a luxury hotel and brought in all these artisans and brought in you know these craftspeople. Uh, Thomas Edison uh, came back really? friends with Thomas Edison. The first building you may not know this. But the first building south of Washington, D.C. to have working electricity was what is today Flagler College. Oh, I did not know that. That's really interesting. Yeah. Lots of you should take the tour. It's uh, it's pretty amazing. Mm. You know, you've heard of, you know, Tiffany, Tiffany Glass and all that. Yeah, stuff. Tiffany. Louis, Tif- Louis Comfort Tiffany um, was also a very dear friend of Henry. I mean, imagine, imagine Henry was then what today Bill Gates would be, right? He's one of the most 
wealthy, successful, financially famous people in the world. That mm-hmm. was Henry Flyer. Um, he was the he was a CFO and a financial advisor to John D. Rockefeller, who founded Standard Oil. Wow. Which is how he got all of his money. He sold a lot of his Standard Oil stock, cashed out, made a ton of money, and then decided to do something else. He came to Florida in the late 1800s uh, on a honeymoon, I think, with his second wife. And um, they traveled by boat over to Palatka. Uh, they wound up um, coming over to St. Augustine on a horse and buggy. Uh, came downtown and saw the Castillo, the big fort, and go, wow, this is a really cool town. It was this kind of old, you know, uh, frontier land, really, at that time. And his wife was like, Henry, this is a cool town. We should do something. And he said, I think I'll build a hotel. And so he built what's now Flagler College as the first luxury hotel, uh, really south of Washington, D.C. Now, I got a question about that because you just mentioned that. Um, in, my, in my mind, I always see, always saw St. Augustine how... It is right now this beautiful tourist spot, historic spot, the oldest city in the United States. Um, do you know if it was um, still like that before Flagler came, or was it just a? I mean, I think it was a garrison town. I mean, in the sense that you know, it was one of those cities, um, towns, really, but a city that uh, because of the Castillo, because of the fort, it was um, it was a port, um, and it was a place where. Uh, the Spanish who came here used this as one of their anchors. It was here, and I think in Pensacola, um, that they um, that they used as a base. Uh, Miami was really kind of a swampland, and there was not a lot of development down in Miami and in Fort Lauderdale and Palm Beach until Henry Flagler actually developed that by building the, the railway. But um, North Florida was kind of where things were at back in the 17 and 1800s in St. Augustine, along with Savannah, along with Charleston, which was one of those, you know, port towns in the southeastern United States. And it was uh, it was an important port, but the city changed hands several times. It was owned by the Spanish, and then it was uh, run by the by the British for about 20 mm-hmm. years. The French tried to get it. Americans tried to get it. Native Americans tried to get it. And every, I mean, they built the Castillo, the fort, as kind of a, uh, you know, a, a walled city, and that's really, um, you know, what what created and protected the uh, the town. So it's got a long history, and I think it was probably up until, uh, you know, after the Civil War, obviously. But at that point, they were trying to figure out what it was going to be, and uh, when finally Florida became a state of the United States, um, then it started developing. But there wasn't really a lot of economic development until uh, Henry Flagler came down and he built the railway. And the reason he built the railway was he knew that in order to be able to bring guests to the hotel, he needed to get them here. So how do you get them here? Well, you build a railway, because that's that was the state-of-the-art transportation back then. There were no planes. You couldn't get in a car and drive down 95. You could get here by boat, or you could get here by rail. Uh, the road systems were very uh, old and antiquated. And so uh, he, built the, he built the Florida East Coast Railway, the FEC. And that really opened up all of the east coast of the United States, of Florida rather, um, from Jacksonville and St. Augustine, which was really the first stretch of the, the rail, uh, all the way down to Palm Beach, and then ultimately Miami, and then in the, and finally he opened up Key West, which was his dream. He wanted to create a single rail line between Key West and Jacksonville, and he did that. So Flag Road played, played a huge role. So, um, you know, for us, you know, being being interested in preserving history and culture and all those things to have saved our building, which is the ice point mm-hmm. we talk about, uh, to be able to take that piece of commercial industrial, industrial commercial history, um, and save that building from being, you know, demol- dem- demolished or torn down and turn that into a, a new vibrant destination. Mm-hmm. Uh, we pur- you repurposed it. Correct. We, you know, we took a building that was, you know, on its last legs. It was in very rough shape when we got it. Um, and it was in a part of town that not a lot of people went to. I mean, West, you know, Lincolnville at that point was still pretty, and is today still, but it's a lot more developed today than it was 10 years ago. But um, it was a part of town that people would not normally go to. See, it's hard to imagine because um, I didn't go to that part of town until your distillery opened up. And um, it's a beautiful area down there. And uh, when you go to the actual ice house, it's really gorgeous. Uh, it's really a gorgeous building, especially when you have the – you had a restaurant on the second floor and a bar on the second floor and the tour itself. And you guys made that nice little sample bar on the last part of the tour. So it's kind of amazing that 
I didn't really know that about the ice house. So it was uh, wasn't in use. It was the would you say it was dilapidated before you got got to well, it? We got it. It was vacant. Um, there was no business operations in it. It had um, the 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 most immediate uh, tenant of the building was a real estate agent who was actually trying to sell the building, which they were having a difficult time. Um, there was a development called the San Sebastian Harbor Project, which mm-hmm. was going to develop open up that whole west side of, of St. Augustine. Uh, and the developer there was moving along. He had made a promise to the owners of uh, the, the what at then was the Ice Plant Building, and when they when they owned it, it was a single address. It was a single business, um, and it, two two couples had bought and owned the building. I think they bought it in the early to mid nineties. And they had upgraded the building at that time to make it a, a manufacturing uh, and sales office for video uh, projection systems. It's a company called Mega Systems, mm-hmm. um, and it was two couples who um, were the founders of that business. And on one half of the building, what's now the gift shop, uh, were offices. So when we first got the building, there was drywall, you know, very low drop ceiling offices on the lower first floor, a couple of bathrooms, a little kitchenette. Um, and then as you walk all the way down to the end, what's now the entrance into the restaurant, um, that set of stairs was there. And then you would walk upstairs. There's actually a platform, so you had to walk through like a three or four foot catwalk. And then you went on to um, the, 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 the sort of back half of the building. Um, and it was just kind of thin carpeting. It was kind of an indoor-outdoor carpeting. It was a little bit sketchy. And the building had been abandoned. But there was this giant wall, Frank, from floor to ceiling, um, and there was another little set of stairs that went up to a what I would call the second or third floor was a small mezzanine, mm-hmm. and up there was a small video projection screen, or much like you would go to the movie theater and there would be that little yeah that little hole in the wall. wall. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was up there, and then as you passed through the center wall, which went floor to ceiling, you know, side to side, that created separation between the front and the back half of the building. Um, you then entered a small little corridor and you walked in and then you were in this pitch dark room black. They had taken all those beautiful windows that's now open in the restaurant and they had paint, they had uh, used, I think, three, three quarter inch drywall, painted it black and blacked out that whole room. There was stadium seating in there and there was a giant movie screen. What? So that's where they actually did the testing and the screening and the sales of their movie projection systems and, and sound systems in that little theater and then next door what is in now the distillery Mm -hmm. actually there was a set of stairs if you go upstairs to the uh uh to the ice plant and if you're ever in that back bar you're going to see kind of a broom closet over on the south wall um between the bar and where the you know first set of tables are but you'll see a little closet door there that actually you would open that door and then there was a set of stairs that you could walk right down into what's now the tasting room the distillery so it's all connected in one building and uh so it's really interesting and next door um they actually had um several manufacturing bays uh there were three what's where the stills are the back half of the building now where the stills are there were uh, three manufacturing bays with drywalls and drop ceilings and all stuff. So they were manufacturing next door um, the old red, green, blue video projection systems. You're probably too young, but back in the day when they wanted to create a color image, you'd have a red screen, the tricolor, right? GB, right? Red, green, blue, mm-hmm. and they would they would have they'd have these very bright lights, and they would ultimately um, you know project and create the colors that you would want that you would see on a TV screen. So they were they were building and manufacturing film uh, mostly video projection systems for you know like epic theaters regal movies mm-hmm. houses and all that stuff and that business ran i want to say from probably the, like 1994 till up to the early 2000s something happened in the business and the building i don't know mm-hmm. and then i want to say from like 2005 until we started looking at that building in 2010 it was defunct and keep in mind right around 2007 2008 the stock market crashed right yeah and the economy was in the tank everybody was scrambling trying to figure stuff out so the building was was defunct the developer who had the um the big property to the north san sebastian uh project uh he went bankrupt foreclosed on everything and the deal that he had made with the two owners of the building went south and all of a sudden now they have no offers on the building. There's no and there's no development. He was going to make it into some sales center, some crazy thing. I don't know whatever happened. And so the building had been vacant for almost four years. And we went in there 
Um, and one of the challenges, quite frankly, was the uh, the owners of the building were now living in two different cities. Um, one of the couples actually had separated. They were divorced. Oh. And so um, I often joke that half of what I did during that first year and a half in development was kind of play counselor to the two couples to try and get them to come to the table to get a deal to sell the building because everybody thought it was worth different things and it was it was a, a classic uh, cluster as they say and um, so we wound, I wound up being able to um, reach a deal where you know we were able to buy the building and uh, and that was how we how we got the building under contract so it was, <laughs> it was quite a story That's, yeah so it's like um it's really a surprising, like hearing all this history part, because I've only been on a couple of tour on the tours here in St. Augustine, so the walk around tours. But really interesting hearing from you, like about Flagler. I didn't know about his, his idea about the railway coming from Jacksonville to Key West. So lots of history. Yeah, things. and like, kind of, I think people who live in Jacksonville, and people who live in Florida, kind of take that for granted, especially someone like me who uh, I didn't realize all that. There was more history to St. Augustine than just the, the ghost tours and the, the alligator farm. Well, I always kind of joke there's, you know, there's the superficial history that you see mm-hmm. that's more commercial and a little bit just on the surface. And then the real stuff, you got to dig. Right? You got you to gotta find, you got to ask. And, and uh, you know, if you talk to locals and you talk to people who live here and you have lived here for a while um, and you get to know them, uh, they'll tell you. And it's fun. That's why I love going into the independently owned restaurants mm. <laughs> because a lot of those are family owned and uh, they've been here for a generation or two or three. And, you know, if, you, if you're visiting to St. Augustine and you take the time, you know, to kind of seek out those places and say, what was it like here when you were growing up? And if they like it, I mean, they'll tell you it's kind of fun. And uh, Wendy and I moved here in, in 1994. We had been vacationing since the early 80s. So we've been coming to St. Augustine for a long time, and uh, it, you know, the longer you live here, at least I've found, the longer you live here, the more I think you appreciate how special the town is, and um, as you get older, which we are, I think I moved here and I was like 37, maybe 38, and now I'm 61, so it's been a while, um, you realize that it, it truly is a special place, and as a result, you want to give back. Um, you have um, you have a true appreciation and empathy, if you will, for um, what a lot of the people have done and sacrificed to get the place to this point. And therefore, um, as we've done, you know, one of the main reasons why we, you know, got the building and, you know, put so much love and special care into it is because we really love living here and we want to preserve it for, you know, the next hundred years. I mean, I, when I occasionally get a chance to give a tour and I, I tell the guests you know on the tour it's like you know it's kind of amazing to think that a century ago the building that the distillery is in was one of the very first commercial ice plants in all of Florida um, it certainly is the oldest ice plant standing in Florida and to know that a century ago ago they were making the first block ice in those same four walls and here we are a hundred years later using local corn local wheat sugar cane, you know, citrus, all those things from Florida to now make these really wonderful, delicious, you know, uh, spirits. Um, and we saved the building. We've re- repurposed it, right? We're now putting it into another chapter in its life. It's a, it's a pretty amazing thing. And I think that's part of what um, gets me so excited about what we do is that, you know, every day we're open and we can tell that story um, and get people to really see and feel that this is authentic. This is real. I mean, the craft spirits that we're making at the distillery are not fabricated. It's not, you know, some juice that was made in Indiana or Kentucky that somebody's, you know, bringing in and putting a cool label on in a bottle and saying, oh, look at what we produced. Or, look at what we made. Now, this, every drop that's made in that building was distilled, you know, in that building. It was really made by hand by real people. And uh, we take great pride in that. Yeah. I think people get it. Yeah, and... um. This is just my my observation, so I don't have the statistics behind that. But I feel like uh, micro breweries, micro dis, uh, distilleries, um, the small businesses, the mom and pop shops that you were talking about earlier, those are actually feel like they're coming back and they're growing. Um, from my standpoint, uh, I feel like uh, what's the word you said earlier? My uh, will be the opinion word. Oh, oh, oh opine. Yeah, my my opine would be a. Uh, 
I feel like people don't want the generic stuff anymore. Don't want that. Here's a label. It's got a fancy label on it, but it doesn't taste good. They want something that's actually homemade or something original. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think particularly with your generation, right? the younger generation, millennials and, and you know, Gen Xers, etc., they're they're looking for a story, right? It's mm, not yeah. just anymore about what is it. It's who made it. How did they make it? Why did they make it? What's the story behind the product? And the character behind it, too. Correct. You know, is it authentic? Is it real? Is it, you know, is it real or is it fake? Is it made with real love and pride? Or do they just, you know, buy the stuff from overseas and, you know, stick a label on it and they're, you know, posturing it? And so I think um, particularly the, you know, younger generations now have, um, and I think a lot of it has to do with their own natural curiosity, which I love. Um, but I also think it's the fact that everybody's walking around with, you know, the most powerful computers in the world in their pockets, right? Yep. So you can immediately pull out your phone and, you know, Google or, you know, ask Siri or Alexa or whatever and say, hey, tell me about this thing. And in 30 seconds, have a ton of content about what this is. And you can, I think, in relatively short time, filter out whether it's, you know, BS or the real deal. And I think people today are much more inclined to pay a little bit more for the real thing. Mm-hmm. Um, particularly if there is authenticity behind it. Um, I often encourage anybody I run into, particularly you know, my employees and coworkers and partners, I encourage them to, to watch a TED Talk. And for anybody who's out there listening, um, there's and I would encourage you to do it, um, there's a TED Talk that's called Start With Why, S-T-A-R-T, and then with a question, why, W-H-Y. It's by a an author and a philosopher and a consultant and just a wonderful guy, one of my heroes named Simon Sinek, uh, S-I-N-E-K. That sounds last familiar, name. his last name. Simon, Simon Sinek, yeah, Sinek or Sinek. Um, nice. He's from Canada, and he's a badass, and he, <laughs> um, he's he got many TED Talks, but this one in particular um, kind of discusses, you know, brands and companies that have been successful, and in his opinion, um is, you know, the most successful brands in the world are ones that clearly are able to define and convey um, not necessarily what they do, Mm -hmm. not necessarily how they do it, but more importantly, why? You know, what's their mission? What's their purpose? Uh, What's their social, um, you know, equation in that? Why are they doing it? To what end? Would you say that falls into individuality? Like a business could be, basically a business entity could be an individual on, on itself. You know, I, I, what I would the way I would answer that, Frank, is I would say both businesses and individuals can have a personality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think go. that's probably closer, you know, to what I, you know. I think you're you're trying to say, and and I I do, I th- and I, but I think the personalities ultimately stem from the leadership, right? Because mm-hmm. the company's core values are going to come from the people who who run it and the people who found it, and um, if they have a set of core values, if all they want to do is make money and <laughs> buy cheap and sell high and everything is one and done and they're going to sell quickly. That's okay. It's their business choice, but their, their, you know, their ethos is just going to be to kind of quickly bang out some money and not necessarily, um, you know, go much more beyond that. Other companies are going to be extraordinarily concerned with the materials that they use, you know, where the glass is coming from, mm-hmm. who the farmers are growing. I mean, in our case, we, you know, we, we work very, very diligently to know the source of all of our products, um, where our glass come from, where our labels come from, where our stills come from. We did a lot of research and we made a very conscientious and concerted decision to, um, to buy American. I wanted to make sure that all of our equipment from our stills to our barrels, to our bottles, uh, to our fermenters, to our boilers, um, chillers, all of those things were made in the United States. Mm-hmm. So I feel like when we invest in our country, we're keeping our dollars you know, here. I think that's a good thing. Um, and I also believe that, um, you know, you should, um, you know, invest in companies who kind of share your core values. So getting back to the Simon Sinek and start with why, um, oftentimes the most successful companies are ones that, um, have clearly kind of defined why they do, uh, the things that they do and what their purpose is. And then when you can surround yourself with both employees and guests, or customers, who share those same core values. So let's say in our case, we love the fact that we're able to save our building. I think our history is important. I think preserving St. Augustine's history is important, right? So when that becomes part of the core mission of our company, that's part of who we are, right? If I believe that buying 
you know, agriculture as close to the distillery as I possibly can, providing it's excellent. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to buy local stuff that's not good, right? Because I have to make a great product. But if I can buy corn and wheat from Florida than, say, Iowa, um, even though I might be able to get it cheaper in Iowa, <laughs> the fact that it's local and it's good, I'm going to pay a little bit more for that because it, it, it sticks to our core values of wanting to support local businesses, right? Um, if somebody believes in the fact that, um, you know, we're going to, try and reinvest some of our profits back into the community. Um, for example, this year we were able to build our first Habitat for Humanity home, which was a, a huge deal for us, something that was very important to me um, and to um, our partners and employees. Um, if somebody else believes in that, that's a good thing. Uh, we give back um, wherever we can uh, to the community. We support the amphitheater. It's one of our mm. um, great uh, great great partners where we're a sponsor there. Great for, concert area for anyone who doesn't live in St. Augustine. Music. But the work that those guys are doing both at the amphitheater and the concert hall and, you know, the, the uh, uh, Sing Out Loud series and all the other cool things that they do um, is really important, I think, for the community. And so we're going to give part of our profits back to them and invest in that by sponsoring some things over there, which we do. Uh, we sponsor the Lincolnville Cultural Center, which is a, a museum in Lincolnville, which is our neighborhood that um, uh, that is telling the African American story of St. Augustine. St. Augustine has a really rich, very diverse history, um, and when we think of St. Augustine, we think of Spanish history, and it's yeah, that's, that what comes to my mind. Correct, but there is a many other layers. It's like any hmm. you know, city that we've got. Think of like a stratosphere of all these different layers that really makes up our history. We have a huge history, uh, black history here in St. Augustine that many people don't know about uh, that stems all the way back to the first, you know, enslaved Americans who left South Carolina for freedom. And they were told by the Spanish, if you can get out of South, if you can get out of South Carolina or Georgia and come to Florida and pledge your allegiance to the king of Spain, Mm -hmm. convert to Catholicism, you will be a free black. So the first free blacks in America were right here in St. Augustine. Kind of a, wow, that's me. I never knew about yeah. that part. So there's a long history. There's Fort Mose, which is a, a beautiful um, a, a historic site that's two miles from here, just north of town. Not a lot of people know about. Uh, Lincolnville got its name from, you know, President Lincoln, mm-hmm. um, because uh, when uh, Civil War was announced and Emancipation uh, Proclamation happened. Uh, they decided to name that part of town in honor of Abraham Lincoln because he was able to set them as free Americans. So it was a big deal. So there's a lot, and then we have a lot of history here in the 1960s during the Civil Rights Movement that people don't know. But um, if you get a chance, go over. I'd love to introduce you to uh, my friends Floyd and Gail Phillips. They're yeah, like, um, really cool people, reminder. and they run that museum. And well, Floyd and Floyd and Gail Phillips, and they are the volunteer director of the Lincolnville Cultural Center. I'll, I'll give you their name off air. Um, or their numbers off. Yeah, they're, they're phenomenal people. I think it'd be great for you to interview them. I think you'll love them. Yeah, I love um, their saints. <laughs> uh, my my thing is, I love um, learning history, like Civil War between Revolutionary War and the Civil War. Uh, my my biggest hero is uh, I have him on my uh, tattooed on my arm. There you go, Abraham Lincoln with a pair of Ray Bans on. Nice. <laughs> Awesome. But I love uh, learning about that stuff. So, yeah, that'd be an interesting, uh, interesting couple interview. Yeah, and they'll give you a tour of the museum and, you know, whether you choose to do a podcast or not. Um, they've got some incredible stories. With all of it. So we invest in things like that that are important to us, right? And, and um, I'm a big believer in reinvesting, you know, in your community wherever possible. I, I tell this uh, almost daily that, you know, when you get to a stage in, in life like mine, you realize several things. Number one, that uh, unfortunately, uh, you don't get to live forever. Maybe it's fortunate. Um, number two, whatever you have, you can't take it with you mm. um, into the next chapter of our lives, whatever that may be. Um, and the third thing is that, uh, you know, if you can leave where you live better for the next generation, um, and we all do that on some small level, that could be, it'll be a very good thing. And I think we'll survive as a, as a society and a community if all of us, you know, are able to practice that on some level. Um, I grew up in the Northeast. I grew up in Connecticut. And uh, when I was there, somebody built, you know, the, the hockey rinks that I learned to skate on. And somebody, you know, bought the land and made the soccer fields that I learned to play soccer on. And they, so at some point in your life, the Native Americans had a, 
a wonderful philosophy about living. Um, and it, and it, it's, 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 it's a pretty amazing story. It says you spend the first third of your life learning. Mm-hmm. You spend the next third of your life doing. And then you spend the last third of your life teaching and giving back. And that's why the elders in the Native American culture were so revered, because they were the ones with all of the knowledge and the history, and they were able to pass that back to, you know, the, the younger generations. And that, that's how they preserved a lot of their history and their story was by that. So having and knowing, having the knowledge and respect for giving back to your community is a very important thing. And I think a lot of people in St. Augustine do that on some level, which is why it's such a a really beautiful town. I think we do it all over America, but I think it's specific here. There's something special about St. Augustine. Like I will say, you mentioned earlier, St. Augustine, um, Charleston and Savannah. Um, those are three unique cities where they're similar because of the Southern, um, the Southern culture, but they're also similar where how they uh, take care of history, yep. how they preserve it. Yeah. And I, and I think that has to do with the length of the city. I think it has to do with, with, um, city pride right in mm-hmm. fact you live here and your dad lived here and your great granddad and great good there's there's some there's some legacy here that that um you know we, wendy and i had lived here for almost 10 years and i was trying to get some things done and some of the local people not all of them but some of them were very suspect what are you, why are you doing that? what's your angle what are you trying to do you know and i was always poo-pooed and in some places you know, you know, we can't do that you're not from here kind of thing and I'll never forget, I was at a public meeting as a city commission, and I was speaking on something, an issue, and, and I said, you know, I really care about this town. I live here now, and I want to make it better. And as soon as I said that, it was almost like it was a, a shift in my own reality that I really did love living here, and I wanted to make it better. But more importantly, I think for me, the local people who lived here who might have been very suspect about some outsider coming in wanting to do something for his or her own personal gain they realized no here's a guy who really does care um you know about the community and it's authentic and it's real so i guess he's okay i'm going to stop busting his jobs and at that point then things started to get much easier to try and do things but it took a while to prove to the locals that a i was legit and mm-hmm. b I care truly about the community and the, the, the steps that I was taking or the things that I wanted to do was really to improve St. Augustine as a place to live and a place to raise your family versus trying to just, you know, make a quick buck, which I think probably a lot of people come here to do. So their, their suspicions were not unfounded, but you know, for me, once I was able to kind of put that out there, um, it, then they, I think they embraced some of the things that, that, that I saw that were areas and, ways to help you know build community and here we are here we are 25 years <laughs> with the distillery and some other cool things some other cool things um yeah i want to get back to the distillery part how do you got because i love like i said earlier i keep i'm gonna keep mentioning i love gin i love spirits um how do you get the recipe how do you guys try to find a specific taste you want to for the gin yeah, yeah. so um just for your own knowledge, and mm-hmm. anybody who's listening, gin is basically um, a flavored vodka. Ah. In the sense that um, vodka is what the, the government, which really sets the definitions of what makes an alcohol, right? Because you have whiskey, mm-hmm. you have rum, you have gin, you have vodka, you have tequila. Um, there's an, there's a, a, a book, or it's a publication online. You can go listen to it or read it. Mm-hmm. If you're... Other and listeners can read it. It's called the Beverage Alcohol Manual. If you want to Google it, you can uh, go to the ttb.gov and just Google Beverage Alcohol Manual. You just Google TTB Beverage Alcohol Manual, and it'll pull up online. And it's a PDF file that's on the government's website. And I think it's Chapter 4, uh, Frank, that will um, give you the guidelines of what constitutes an alcohol and a particular type of alcohol. So, for example... All whiskeys are um, alcohol distilled from grain. Okay? Mm-hmm. So the whiskey could be made from rye, you've heard of rye whiskey, you've heard mm-hmm. of corn whiskey, you've heard of a weeded whiskey, you've yeah. heard of bourbons. Those are all alcohols that are fermented and distilled. The base source of the alcohol is grain, and that's and there's certain proof it can't be distilled any higher than I think the 165. In some cases, they have to go into new oak barrels. 
Um, they can't be bottled at a lower than 80 proof. There's a bunch of criteria and stuff, but fundamentally it's whiskeys are made from grain. Rum, mm -hmm. on the other hand, is distilled from sugar. Mm -hmm. Okay, so whiskey, grain, rum, cane. Think of it that way, okay? You can take any fermentable source. It could be wheat, it could be corn, it could be barley, it could be potatoes. It could be potato bucket, potato bucket. Yeah. Taken potatoes, have taken those starches, convert them into alcohol. Uh, they feed that. They they feed the, that that starch and sugar uh, yeast. That yeast eats the alcohol, and that's how alcohol is made. You make a beer first, and then you put it into the still. And what the still does is rectify it or in, in, increase the percentage of alcohol in that. If you were to take, um, as we do every day at the distillery, if you were to take a combination of grains. Uh, in our case, corn, wheat, and barley. That's our mash bill for our bourbon. Mm -hmm. If you were to take that and cook it and then add yeast and then ferment it for four or five days, you're going to get to about 10 to 12 alcohol by volume. You're going to have this giant vat of grits, if you will, mm -hmm. made from those grains that has about 12 to 14% alcohol in it. That's it. That's all you get. Basically, you have a beer. <laughs> what distillation does is take that alcohol that has been created naturally by the consumption of the sugar by yeast, which is a live animal. When yeast eats sugar, three things happen. CO2 is created. Um, heat is generated because of all that friction I, I kind of described. Um, you know, inside of those fermenters, like a big game of Pac-Man, you have these yellow guys, waka, 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 waka. It's eating. So the yeast is eating the sugar. Mm -hmm. the yeast eats the sugar. The yeast dies. CO2 is created, heat is generated in the process, but the byproduct or the co-product is ethanol, alcohol. So that's how alcohol is actually created. And it happens in wine, it happens in beer, and it also happens when you make spirits. But to make a spirit, you're making a beer first. That's the first step. You then take that beer and then you distill it. And distillation is a, is a heating and cooling process by which you're going to raise the temperature of that solution that the alcohol is in to separate the alcohol from the water. And that's what distillation's taking the tour. You see the kind of cool copper pot stills. You're going to see a big fat belly on the bottom. That's called the kettle. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to see this kind of tall cylindrical chimney stack. Yeah. Right? That's called the, the uh, column. And as you, so we, we're going to cook the grains in that big silver tent mashed on in the beginning. And we're going to pump it over to the fermenters that are temperature controlled. We feed it yeast. We keep it happy for four or five days. And after about four days, the, there's no more sugar. The yeast has done its thing. And we pump that whole thing over into the belly of the big still, called the stripping still. We're then going to heat that up in the bottom. And as you heat, as you increase that heat, um, you're going to wind up creating an environment where the, the, the vapors, the volatile elements of the alcohol, because they have a lower boiling point, right? A boiling point is when a solution goes from one state to another. Mm -hmm. It goes from a liquid to a vapor, and then it evaporates and it goes up, right? So in the case of alcohol, the boiling points start anywhere at 140, 145, and um, those vapors are going to naturally go into the air. Well, inside that still, which is a, which is a sealed system, right, those vapors are going to rise to the top of that column, and then at the very top of that column, we have a four-inch pipe that has colder temperatures that are going to draw those vapors across. Mm -hmm. And then even colder temperatures are down at the bottom of that um, condenser, and we're going to take those vapors and convert them back to a liquid. So you're separating the alcohol through distillation from the heating and a cooling process, and we're going to take it from a liquid state to a vapor state back to a liquid state, and in the process, improve or increase the alcohol percentage. So all of those things have really to do with distillation. Um, gin so you can take any of those alcohols. You can take corn, wheat, barley, rye, whatever, distill it to 160 and it becomes a whiskey. If you keep distilling it over and over and over and over and you increase the heat, you increase the temperature, and you have enough um, changes where it's going from a liquid to a vapor, you're going to remove all of the elements other than just the alcohol. You're going to make it a nearly pure alcohol. You can get it, They call it a neutral spirit, Frank. Mm -hmm. So the government defines a neutral spirit as any alcohol that has been distilled to 193 proof or higher mm -hmm. that is colorless, odorless, and tasteless. Okay. When you distill it to, to a state that pure, there's nothing but alcohol. Okay? And if you drank it, you die because it's 
basically that's what you consider that rubbing alcohol? Or is it can like- be certain rubbing alcohol for mm-hmm. you that way. Um, it's an ethyl alcohol. Mm-hmm. What, what you then do to make vodka is you take that pure form of alcohol and you slowly add water to it. And you're going to now dilute it and take mm-hmm. it from 193 proof. Keep adding water, keep adding water, keep adding water. And all of a sudden, slowly it's hit 80 proof. Voila, guess what you have? You have vodka. So vodka is any fermentable source that has been distilled to 193 proof that is then diluted or proofed down to 80 proof or 40 percent alcohol by by uh, uh, alcohol by volume abv and just again the thinking keeping when you hear something that says oh it's 80 proof it's really divided by two and that's the alcohol so, content yeah. source, right so that's going to be the alcohol so the al- the abv may be 40 but it's 80 proof um proof was a term that was given to alcohol back in the 17 and 1800s when they were starting to collect taxes and proof really meant that you proved Mm p-r-o-v-e-d that there was that it was alcohol and in order to get it to that proof level it had to be able to light on fire so i think that the 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 actual uh the percentage of alcohol is 50 percent or 100 proof at that point it will flout if you try to light 80 proof it won't but i think once you get to 100 it it does i don't know the exact number but a proof is basically, it's an old term that the tax guys created to prove that the alcohol was actually alcohol. Um, and then they taxed it based on that. So getting back to gin and vodka. Gin, as we just learned, is any fermentable you know, material that's been cooked and then distilled up to 193. And then you have a neutral spirit. So we proof that down. All you do is you add water to it. Voila, you have vodka. Mm-hmm. That's all vodka. That's why you see so many vodkas on the shelf, and they're so inexpensive. Yeah, the cheap plax- all, plastic ones. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's because it's really, really cheap, highly rectified, not particularly well-made um, alcohol. Pop off. Pop off. Pop off. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. Respectfully. <laughs> all brands are good, right? Not missing anybody. But um, effectively, that's what, alcohol, that's what vodka is. So to make a gin, you're going to take that same base neutral spirit, and you're going to proof it down to maybe, oh, 100, right? So it's still got a lot of alcohol in it, but it's just water in there. And you're going to put it in a still, and then you're going to add botanicals. And gin really got its name from the Dutch in the 1500s because they would flavor that alcohol with a berry Gen- called Geneva. Oh. So the French, the excuse me, the Dutch term for juniper is Geneva, oh, G-E-N- G-N-E-V-E-R. And they shortened it to gin. So juniper is the, in, in, the English term mm-hmm. for Geneva, which is the Dutch term for the for the for the juniper berry. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, then they use those juniper berries to flavor the gin, and therefore that's how it got its name. So they're just taking vodka, macerating it, which means you basically dump those dry botanicals into the solution. That alcohol has a lot of intensity and it's going to pull out the oils from those botanicals right and then now you've got this high proof alcohol with all these oils in it well you turn the still on what's going to happen it's going to slowly heat up the alcohol is going to separate from that liquid state to a vapor state back to a liquid state and as part of that distillation you're going to collect some of those flavors from the juniper berries and that's how gin is created so that's a crash course to one of those gins. When you hear a London dry gin, basically it's a, a high percentage of gin, of juniper berries actually in that gin. And then beyond that, um, you would, uh, in some cases, you're going to have lots of other, you know, botanicals included. So getting back to your question a few minutes ago, you know, what was the inspiration for our gin? Uh, we were making what we believe to be the first gin in Florida. Um, and we wanted to a we are committed to making every spirit that we do excellent. Mm-hmm. We're not going to put out crap. Um, it's who we are. Like I said, I, I want to leave this earth better than I found it. And the way you do it is by making excellent things. And uh, so nothing that we're going to make, we're not going to take any shortcuts at St. Augustine's story. We're going to do everything right. So um, we had, um, at the time, two really, really talented people. Uh, one was a, a, a specialized in distilling, and the other um, was a bartender. Um, and the cool thing is he had the ice plant on one side of the building with some of the best bartenders in the state, and then he had the distillery on the other side of the building with some of the best distillers in the state and in the country. And um, in my direction and request to both of them, as I said, look, we're making the first gin in Florida. Let it speak to Florida. Let it be Florida's gin. 
So when you think of Florida guys, what do you think of? Thought about it, and they came back to me and said, well, Philip, you think of Florida, I think of sunshine. Awesome. Nice <laughs> warm. Uh, I think of citrus. Excellent. Mm-hmm. That's what I think of, too. Um, I think of something that's you know approachable, something bright, something fun. And those are really the core values around what I wanted to you know, create the gin flavor. So they spent um, six months in the lab um, piloting different botanicals. So we got 13 or 15 different kinds of orange peel, and we got 19 different kinds of lemon peel. We went through all mm-hmm. these different combinations of different citrus. Uh, we got a bunch of, obviously, juniper berries. We had cinnamon and star anise and not a lot of really cool excuse me a lot of things I need to do that <laughs> yeah, lot. I'm so off excited with that. <laughs> um, damn, I hit the microphone yeah, for anybody okay. listening <laughs> poor, send poor Frank out of his chair um, I was so excited talking about how we met our gym but anyway we really wanted to make it citrus forward and, and make it something that could be delicious but also we wanted to make sure that it could make a really delicious cocktail when somebody brought it home and they made a gin and tonic or they wanted to make a martini or they wanted to make a Negroni or they wanted to make mm. a, a Martinez or one of the other classic gin cocktails that it would perform that way. So we had two really super talented people spend a lot of time making that gin and it, it came out wonderfully. So um, we're really proud of it. It's It's been one of our uh, most uh, favorite spirits. We have a lot of people who mm-hmm. drink the gin and they go, it's because I never liked gin before, but I love your gin. And, uh, well, one thing I like about your store and inside the actual um, distillery is that when I took the tour, I didn't I usually drink gin and tonics with the, you know, the normal clear water one. Right. Um, the tour guide or, or the bartender that I was working said, like, no, that's not the proper gin. It's supposed to be actually um, a browner color. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a um, syrup, right? Because I, I, bought, I bought the actual proper ton- I'm not, not gin. The I mean, the syrup. tonic. Yeah, the actual tonic itself. Yeah. And it's darker, but it tastes amazing. Yeah, so we uh, we had that made for us, and that is a tonic syrup. And tonic, uh, you know, back in the day, you know, the gin and tonic was was given to the British sailors as a rations, as a way to prevent scurvy. Mm-hmm. Um, and what they found was that quinine, which was a, a tree bark um, from the quinine, is extracted from the cinchona tree. I think it's a bark. Um, and they would take that, they would extract it, and they found that that would prevent you from getting yellow fever and scurvy and all these diseases. And malaria. Malaria, all those things. So they wound up, the, the Royal Navy, the British Royal Navy, Frank, gave those as rations every day. They would get their gin and their, and their quinine, and, mm-hmm. tonic, and they would put quinine in that tonic water. So cinchona bark extract is actually um, is, is a color. It's a darker color, yeah. and that's where it gets its, its color from. But to me, it tastes, it tastes a lot better than... The well, we use agave, we use uh, <laughs> cinchona extract, we use some other you know, natural flavors that give it that, that flavor, but it's uh, it's really delicious. And again, it's all about authenticity, right? Somebody's going to drink you know, gin and tonic, you could go get a bottle of you know, Hendrix, or you could get a bottle of you know, a, a budget gin, mm-hmm. uh, you know, pick your, uh, oh, your choice, one. right? And then... Uh, and then just go get a bottle of, you know, inexpensive, you know, fizzy water. It's quinine water. Mm-hmm. Right? Put in a lemon, and that's your gin and tonic. And that's what most people think of when they think of it. Yeah, that's what I always thought it was. Right. And I- for us, we were like, no, we're going to make it different. And that's really what our company has always been about, is to make things a little bit different and, and provide that content, provide that education and that story behind it so people know what they're drinking. They know the history of where, where it came from. And hopefully they like it. You know, that's the main thing. And this is the thing I, I tell um, anybody, you know, who, uh, who I get a chance to speak with about um, our spirits. It, in a sense, um, you want to drink what you enjoy. Right? Mm-hmm. So if you love scotch, you're probably going to not really go crazy for bourbon because, you know, malted barley and peated barley, it's going to have a very different flavor profile than, than bourbon. And if conversely, if you like... Um, rum you may not like whiskey because maybe your palate is skewing something sweeter right mm-hmm. and there's no right or wrong answer for somebody to say this is the best whiskey in the world it's like <laughs> well in your opinion it's the best whiskey in the world opine right we're mm-hmm. back to it um so for us i mean we're gonna make the best spirits we possibly can i really enjoy you know tonight's friday night i'm probably gonna wind up having a cocktail it's the weekend, <laughs> right? yeah. i enjoy 
you know, may, I, I really enjoy making, you know, and, and then enjoying the spirits that we make. I hope that the public in, who drinks them will like them. If they don't, or if a critic says, hey, I think it tastes this way and I don't like it, I'm going to give it a low score. It hasn't happened uh, very often, but when it does, I don't take personal offense to it because at this point it's more about, you know, what you like may be different than, you know, what I like in terms of the flavor profile. And I try and tell guests at the end of the day, don't feel badly that, you know, whether it's our spirit or something else that maybe you do or you don't like. We hope you like it. Most people do. But you should, you want to drink what you want to drink. And that's what I try and tell people. If you like, if you like, you know, rum and Coke, go for it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you like a Jack and Coke or whatever, root beer, it's all about what really is going to make your mouth happy. Because for me, alcohol is really a means to to be a social time to be with your family and yeah. friends. It's a social lubricant. If you fly, if you use uh, wisely, yeah. you don't go overboard with it. And, uh... For sure. And it's a way, I mean, I, I, I'll i try and send you a picture of it. Maybe you can include it. But yeah, of course. You know, at the end of the day, I, I wrote, when we started the company almost six years ago, I wrote, a, I don't know, three or four paragraphs about what the mission of the company really is. And it rests in our museum. If you go in there next time you take a tour just before you enter the the, uh, the theater, you're going to see this big giant, you know, medallion. It's beautifully done, and um, it, it, you know, I think at the root of it, you know, what I what I say is that I we built the company really to make the best possible spirits using Florida agriculture. We want to support Florida farms. We want to help, you know, reinvest in the local community. Um, we want to do as many good things as we can because it's the right thing to do. But at the end of the day. We're making this so that people can enjoy the best moments of their lives together. Whether it's going out on a date or having a picnic or mm-hmm. you're having a family gathering, um, you know, or you just want to sit by the fire and enjoy a, you know, a really delicious bourbon over one mm-hmm. big ice cube. Um, <laughs> and you're going to sit there holding your you know, girlfriend or your you know, boyfriend's hands, whatever it is. That's why we make it. We make it so that people can enjoy the best moments of their lives together. And whatever form that takes place, those are those are your choice. Yeah, and plus it always goes good with food. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, I want to ask this question because uh, who are, I'm pretty sure there's people that are going to be listening that they're thinking about starting their own business. may not be a distillery or a brewery or a winery, but it might be um, wanting to start their own business. And you had a business before the distillery. Uh what would you say is kind of some of the biggest pitfalls you had or biggest problems you have, and how did you solve them? In opening a distillery or just any business in general? We'll say, we'll go with the distillery first. So, um, that's, a, that's a great question. Because um, I'm pretty sure a lot of people do have, can learn from you when it comes to actually making something successful, but there's always problems along the, along the way. I'm thinking, um, I, I would say, number one, be be really, really take time to think about what you want to make and probably more important, why, Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, why are you doing it? You know, are you doing it just for fun? Is it a hobby? Do you want to, is it a financial thing? You think you can make a bunch of money out of it? Um, understand in real terms, you know, why, why you want to do what you're going to do. Uh, you know, there, I have learned so much about this industry in the last seven years. Um, I could probably write several books about them. Um, and I, I guess what I would first say is, no, it, it is a very um, exciting and, and, and dynamic industry. I would also say it's, it's a very complex mm-hmm. uh, industry because it's a regulated industry. It's not like... Um, it's not like any other product in the economy because any other product, if you are, if you're, if you're a shoemaker or you're a craftsman and you're going to make, you know, a craft, whatever that might be, maybe it's coasters and you're going to etch them out of balsa wood and you're going to put a logo on it or you're going to customize it for somebody or you want to make a, you want to make a shoes or you want to make clothing or you want to provide a service. Generally speaking in this day and age, particularly as I said, because we have these giant powerful <laughs> tools in our pockets now called, you know, lap, called uh, iPhones and cell phones, right? Androids. Um, people can find stuff very, very easily. And now with Amazon prime and all these, you know, 
instant, you know, next day and second day, you know, delivery services, you can order anything immediately. Mm -hmm. Um, Alcohol, because it is a regulated industry and there's a lot of rules, there's a lot of laws about it. And I could, again, I could do a whole separate podcast on it. Um, It's very challenging to get the product to the consumer because by law, other than selling the bottles out of our gift shop, of which I'm limited, by the way, to only selling six bottles a year. I can only sell you yeah, six bottles. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that later. but get into that. Yeah. There's, there's a whole story there. Um, but if I want to sell that product, I have to sell it to a licensed distributor who then takes it, brings it into their market warehouse. They obviously have overhead, so they mark it up. And then they'll turn around and sell it to a retailer who then takes it and marks it up. And so you have these multiple layers of mandatory i can't just turn around and ship it to you so you're like hey philip this is great i'm going back to jacksonville Mm -hmm. i don't want to carry this stuff with me can you ship it to me i cannot do that i legally cannot ship from my tasting room to anybody um i would go to jail if i did that it's Mm -hmm. crazy that in this day and age you have an entrepreneur who you know who who put this kind of investment and yet you know the law says you can't ship it you can't you can't profit from that directly you have to go through this um, you know, very expensive and very complex, uh, you know, route to market. So understand that as this is all back to, you know, what counsel would I have for somebody who's opening up a business or mm-hmm. up a distillery? I would say, know what you want to make. I would say research your local laws uh, very, very carefully and know how you can sell your product, how you're limited. Understand the sales and distribution side of it because it's extremely complex. It's also wicked competitive. Um, and it's very expensive because to get your product to market, um, even though we have to sell through a licensed distributor, that distributor also carries hundreds of other brands, right? They're going to carry, and I'm making these names up, but they might carry Bacardi, they might carry Grey Goose, they might carry Tito's in the spirits, in the whiskey category, they might carry Jack Daniels or Woodford or Buffalo Trace or all these other really great brands. And these brands have huge, huge marketing budgets, right? These are billion dollar corporations who have been getting their product to market for years and they have the relationships with the distributors. They have the relationships with the bars and restaurants. They have the relationships with the, with the retail package stores, right? So here you are as an unknown brand coming in and saying, hey, this is Frank's. I'm going to make a wonderful, you know, spice rum. It's going to be Frank's spice rum. It's going to be awesome because I'm going to make it awesome. That's be great. Well, one of the challenges that Frank's rum would have, despite how wonderful it may be and how much love and passion you put into it, you're going to have to compete in a very, very uh, competitive marketplace. Because if you think about it, you know, walk into any bar, walk into any liquor store, and most of the times you're going to see that those shelves are filled, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to get your bottle up there, you got to knock somebody else out. Yeah. Because they're not going to build additional space for you. And you have to be able to prove to that retailer, and that retailer could be an ABC, it could be Publix, it could be Total, it could be an uh, independent retailer like a Browdy, somebody like that. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to prove to that retail owner why they should take, you know, that Tito's off, or they should take that, you know, that bottle of uh, Jack Daniels off the shelf and that facing and give one to you. And you better be prepared to answer it. And if they give you that chance, you then have a very short period of time to have people go in and start buying that. And it gets, it's relatively easy. It's never easy, but it's relatively easy in your hometown, right? So if you're going to open up Frank's Rum in Lakeland, Florida, right? It's going to be awesome. There's no other rum makers in Lakeland, and you're going to be the guy. In Lakeland, particularly if you get out and you work the market and you meet the local retailers and you talk to the bars and restaurants, there's a pretty good chance they'll carry because they're local. They know you. They're going to want to help you. But the further away you get from your hometown, right, now you try and go to Orlando or worse, go to Miami or worse, go to Atlanta or, yeah. God forbid, New York, right? <laughs> Those people don't know you. Mm-hmm. And you're going to be one of 10,000 bottles of rum that they're going to be presented that year by their multiple distributors. There's not just one distributor. There's several distributors, and they're all big, and they all have lots of different categories. Um, And so what I would say back to the person who's thinking about going into it, know what you want to make, have a plan, and really research and test your assumptions about where you're going to be able to sell your product. Are you going to sell it from your gift shop? Are you going to sell it through, you know, a bar and restaurant that's in your town? Are you going to be able to sell it at your local, you know, retail store, whatever that might be? 
be it a chain or an independent, and how many do you think you can sell? And I would spend as much time talking to those retailers and those bars first before I made the investment, um, simply because I've seen so many people who come in and they take their life savings or they talk to an uncle and they raise fifty or hundred thousand dollars and they get a sale. We're going to make the greatest vodka in the world. Well, if you talk to any owner of a bar or a restaurant and say, "Hey, I've got a new vodka." They're going to look at you like you have two heads because there's so many vodkas oh, my new ones. on the shelf. They're going to say, I, I had a great conversation with a guy named Pat Croce. He owns, um, he owns a number of bars. Actually, he no longer owns it. Actually, his son and son-in-law own it. Great people. But he owns a bar called the Green Turtle. And, and I think Green Turtle can pair it down to Key West. Forget me, Pat, for not knowing the name. Um but they own several bars down in Key West, really, really very successful bars. Green Parrot, I'm almost sure. And um, he said to me when we were opening the store, he says, Philip, I understand what you're doing. I have 157 rooms on my bar right now. Wow. Why do I need one more? Wow. <sighs> and I was like, uh, blah, 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 blah. and I was tap dancing and I didn't have an answer for him. I do now, but I didn't then. But the, 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 the reality is for anybody who's going to get into this industry, it is uh, insanely competitive. Yeah. It's also very expensive to play in because unlike craft beer, the craft beer guys, even 20 and 30 years ago when they were getting in, it was a different marketplace because you were competing against two or three companies who all made the same thing. You were competing against Budweiser, Coors, and Miller. They all made a pale lager ale, and that's what America drank, mm -hmm. right? So along comes somebody who says, hey, I'm going to make an IPA. That's cool. That's different. I'm going to make a stout. I'm going to make a this. I'm going to make a that. I'm going to make a pumpkin ale. I'm going to make all this cool, pumpkin. right? <laughs> People are like, oh, shit, that's cool. I if I can say that word. Now you can curse on here. Sorry. Um, I, I can make some things in mm -hmm. small quantities that the big boys can't do very quickly. And it's going to be radically different than what's on the shelf now. So you couple that marketplace where three big companies all making virtually to the, in the consumer's mind, the same thing, right? Bud Light, Bud, Pale Ale. I mean, they're the lager beer. They're all kind of look the same. They all package the same. They all kind of have the same advertising. And all of a sudden these upstart breweries come in and say, Hey, I can, I'm Sam Adams or I'm Dogfish ale or, um, you know, whatever the, you know, cool beers are. And they were dramatically different. And people like, hell, I'll pay, I'll pay a lot more for that. That's got a lot more flavor to it. So you have these smaller companies who are making a product that's very, very different than what was on the shelf. So you could differentiate yourself pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Well, take that now, 20 years later, with craft distilling, where now you're saying, hey, I'm going to make a new rum. And it's going to be delicious, and it's going to be local, and it's going to be awesome. And it's going to be made from sugar cane or whatever. Cool. Let me taste it. It's kind of young. It's kind of hot. It hasn't had time in the barrel. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem with any brown spirit, including whiskey and including rum, is it takes time in a barrel for that stuff to become not only drinkable, but actually good. It takes years, correct? Oh, in our case, Florida, and we'll talk about Florida versus Kentucky versus Scotland in a minute, but... Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, you're gonna you're gonna need between three and six years, depending upon where you are, to age something really well. Mm. And in the case of Scotch, it could take anywhere from ten to fifteen years because of the environment. I can talk all about that in a second. But specific to rum, which a lot of people are making now in Florida, which is awesome. The problem with rum is that you are competing against countries that have been making and and rum distilleries that have been making rum for like decades right so think about bacardi right think about um any of the great rum companies and there's tons of them um uh, ron zacapa and zaya and um florida Cana in, in in costa rica and venezuela there's so many great rums out there they have several things going for them number one they have time on their side right they've been they were laying down these barrels of rum 10 12 10 15 years ago so that rum's been aging a really long time they also have a much better sugar source than we do because the the quality of your source material is going to be a direct 
influence or on the flavor of the product, right? So in the islands, the rum making equipment, the sugar making equipment that they have there generally is going to be um, less efficient in terms of extracting the rum. So here in the United States, we have big companies, um, you know, Domino's or uh, any of these other big companies um, who are... Um, uh, who, are, who are making rum, and rum is basically made from molasses. Often, it's usually black strap. Molasses. You say Domino's? So Domino sugar, um, oh, okay, Florida, sugar. Florida crystals, right? So we have big. Sugar. I thought the pizza for some reason. No, we have, we have no, we have right Domino's crystals, um, Florida crystals, the, the big sugar producers here in Florida, right? So they're going to make rum. They're going to make sugar. The byproduct or co-product of sugar production, Frank, is molasses. Mm -hmm. um, and in this country, those guys do a really good job of getting most of that sugar out of it so that the molasses that is out there in the market locally to make it has lower content levels of sugar because it's been extracted more efficiently here and it has higher contents of ash. So it's going to have a little bit more bitterness and it's going to have less sugar where in the islands they don't have nearly as efficient rum uh, sugar extracting process. So the, rum, the black strap or the molasses they're going to get there is going to be way richer. It's going to be much better starting source. So they start with better material. And generally speaking, uh, most of the island, uh, you know, produces a rum, have a better climate, and they're going to they're going to have age on their side. So you can, you can, plus they have inventory. They've been making this stuff forever, right? So they've got thousands and thousands of barrels that they can pick from and say, these are the best barrels, and this is going to make this great 12-year-old Sakop or something like that. Well, you taste that, and that's like, $25 on the shelf, you can get an incredibly delicious, um, you know, bottle of, of, of older Añejo aged mm -hmm. rum, uh, you know, in any of the liquor stores, yet you go to a local craft and they're going to say, hey, for $30, you can get a silver rum made locally. Well, if you taste it, do a blind taste it side by side. It's, it's, not, even, it's not even close. Mm -hmm. So spirits have a much harder time um in the short term to be able to compete effectively against the bigger brands simply because they don't have the age um and they don't have the um the marketing you know capacity mm. to do so to anybody who would get into the industry i would say you know enter cautiously right yeah um talk to as many distillers as you can in the markets that you want to be in see who, who who's out there already making it find out what they're making um are you going to be another vodka are you going to be another whiskey you're going to be another rum or are you going to try and make maybe a unique product that somebody else isn't making it um you know and what's your story what somebody once told me is you know to be successful in the in this industry and i think it applies to many but to be successful, you have to have good juice, you have to have a good bottle, and you have to have a good story. Hmm. So you got to figure those things out ahead of time. But your story comes from the soul of who you are and what you're trying to make. So, Well, I feel like I'm learning a lot from you because um, yeah. when it comes to uh, this podcast, I feel like there's a lot of similar challenges where you just uh, want to I'm dealing with a market that's... Uh, um, what's that word? Um, saturated. There we go. Dealing with saturated market, and how am I going to, um, you know, push myself out there as a, as a quality brand? And uh, no, it's like listening to you. It's like, huh, there's a lot of stuff I could take away from this. What? Well, how to solve the problem? How to actually uh, market myself? How to do it right? But like, I feel like what you're saying too, can, you can apply it to other businesses also. Hundred percent. No, there's there's no doubt. I mean, I think you know the key to the key to marketing, whether it's you're going to try and you know figure out how to gain a broader audience in this mm -hmm. podcast, or um, you're going to start a you know a new car service and call it Lyft or call it uh, uh, any of the others. Um, you, you have to have a story, and I think mm -hmm. you have to give people reasons. It's funny, I was. I was asking somebody recently about, you know, their, their approach to social media and, you know, what, what makes certain people followed and others people not. He said, because you, you have to understand social media is really a social environment. You, you are talking directly to your audiences and you have to take the time. You have to give it the respect. You have to give the people who are following you the respect. If somebody gives you an email, you have to respond to them immediately. You can't let it sit for five days. If somebody sends you an Instagram mm -hmm. post, you respond to that immediately because that is your audience. That's your base, right? Huh. So, um, and, and the other thing is people follow other people because there's something in it for them, right? So as you create this podcast, for example, mm -hmm about you for a second <laughs> um you know you can you know i think in a way create a theme that says hey when you listen 
you know, to this show, you're always going to get a unique perspective because I'm focusing, as you said before, on empathy. That's a, that's a theme. So if that really is the core to, you know, your, your purpose, your mission, right? You want to continue to tell people stories. You want to help educate people and get people to maybe think more or have more real conversations or communications and start building community through engagement. Again, I'm not sure exactly, you know, what the core, you know, mission is, uh, you know, of this podcast, but when you do that, Frank, and then you can, um, define that well, and then start, you, you'll, you're going to love the Simon Sinek YouTube video. I, I really encourage you to watch it this weekend. But once you figure out your why, then you can begin to find other people who share those same yeah. values. Um, and then they will hopefully continue to follow you. I think people who enjoy our spirits, whether it's our gin or our bourbon or vodka rum or any of the other products we make, I think fundamentally they all taste pretty good mm-hmm. normally, generally um not everybody's gonna like it but no nah, i'm picky about alcohol and i like it good. thank you for saying <laughs> that so we're going to try and make it good and that's kind of the baseline you have to have good juice right but then beyond that you know in our story you know we we talk about our partnerships with our local farms which are real uh we talk about with saving and preserving and restoring our building which is really our mm-hmm. home which is very real we love that uh, we talk about um you know creating we're now up to 53 jobs that have created it. The distillery um, staff who works there, I think, really enjoys it. They, um, they, they like what we stand for as a company. Um, they like our mission. They like our purpose. And so they feel connected in some way to it. Um, the fact that we are making some of the first and best alcohols, you know, in Florida with our bourbon and our gin, they're winning a bunch of awards and people really like it. That's important. So there's a connection or give back to the community, as I said before, whether it's Habitat or the amphitheater or the arts or any of the other things that we, we support, all of those things tend to, um, how would I say it? I think they create opportunities for people to become engaged with your brand. And once you do that, And you're providing them, you know, with value. And that value could come in the form of a good tasting spirit. But the value might also be the fact that they support the things that we do. I love the arts. I love the fact that you guys are helping to put arts in schools or you're helping to tell the story of Lincolnville Cultural Center or you're supporting the amphitheater or you're doing Habitat uh, uh, for Humanity Homes. Any of those things, once people kind of realize, well, not only is it a great tasting spirit, my God, these guys are really helping give back to the community i'm going to make a conscious choice to buy them that's and support them right um certainly we want people to enjoy responsibly i don't expect Mm -hmm. people to bring a bottle of our whiskey in a day i hope they don't you know but when guests come in i would hope that it might be you know one of the ones that be on the shelves um because then they can tell the story and say let me let me tell you about my hometown you know bourbon here it's delicious but look at all the cool things these guys do Mm -hmm. Um, that's my that's my dream date, you know, is to get people to that point where they understand and can relate to um, why we started the company, why we're working so hard to make great spirits, but also um, the sort of virtuous cycle that we hope to create um, in everything that we do. I mean, we've taken this whole building, we put a lot of love into it, we had a vision, we've restored it, and now it's become this great destination that's helping to preserve and tell stories and hopefully we'll be here for maybe another hundred years. Right. I I hope a century from now, this building is still happening and, um, you know, people are still enjoying great spirits made in those four walls. That would be awesome. Um, the, you know, the, the fact that we, um, you know, do try and help support the community on a number of levels is important. I hope that meaningful to people, but we, you know, we, we love that paying it forward. Um, I was going to talk about our manufacturing cycle of the whiskey in particular. You know, we buy our corn and our wheat locally, mm-hmm. and we cook that alcohol. We take the alcohol, we distill it over, and then it you know goes into low wines, and then into you know finished spirit, and ultimately into barrel where it sits for three years before it becomes our, our straight bourbon. Um, but uh, in the process of cooking the alcohol, we use about one third of that mash comes over as alcohol but two-thirds of it remain behind can't really do anything with it well turns out that it's really good food for 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 cattle Mm -hmm. and um so we have a local partnership uh, with the decoy farm here in st john's county and twice a week they send their truck over we load it up with two to three thousand gallons of cooked grains that they then take back for free 
to feed their animals, and they're able to raise another 100, 150 head of cattle every year because of the free food that we've given them. So it's that virtuous local cycle, right? We buy our corn locally, and we distill it into spirits. We give those cooked grain back to the farm. The farm then takes that uh, feed, gives it to their animals. Their animals fertilize the soil. First of all, it keeps the animals healthy. It's great food, much richer in protein than the regular you know food they get, and they like it. Call them happy cows. <laughs> um, they do the cows actually come running over to the truck once they see it because they, they know it's the good stuff um, and then from there they um, the cattle fertilize the soil it grows next year's crop of corn so it's this beautiful virtuous cycle it helps the farmers it helps us and that really is um, you know, one of the things that we try and look at at every particular part of our operation is how can we do it better how can we do it more sustainably and how can we, it gets back to my thing earlier, you don't live forever and whatever you have, you can't take it with you. And the third thing is if you can leave where you live better for the next generation for you, mm-hmm. for example, and your kids, if you ever you know, choose to have them, um, I, I believe that that's, it's part of our responsibility of people to, to do that. Because again, somebody did it before us. And if we are able to focus part of our efforts on doing that while we're, you know, um, capable as adults, um, and we teach our children well. Right. Teach your children. Mm-hmm. We teach them how to do it. Then think that things will continue, and you know our world will be a better place and sustainable. And before we go on, how much time do I still have with you? Because I know you're a busy guy. Uh, I, I, I'd love to wrap it up maybe in the next fifteen twenty minutes. Yeah. Okay. Ago. Then we'll uh, we're gonna start with our uh, the questions for sure. anyone that is uh, new to the show, which is probably a lot of people because it's still growing. Uh, these are interpersonal questions. I use, I was a psychology major, so I love psychology. But the reason why I asked these questions at the last uh, part of the interview, interview is that because um, I have different different types of people on the show, come from different ta- different walks of life, got different opinions. Uh, I ask these questions because they show a different side of that person, that a little bit more vulnerable side. Sure. The reason why. I want to ask these questions in an interview because no matter what you feel about the person or uh, how they live their life, if you completely disagree with them, or I mean, if everything they said, you could at least connect to them at some point, at some level. Sure. Um, we were talking before we started the podcast, the reason why I uh, really want to fo- not focus on this, but ask these questions because um, I feel like in the world today, we're so used to just kind of labeling people and not giving people a chance to actually show them who to show them who they really are and accept them for who they are so this is why i asked these questions at the last part of the interview sure. so uh these are little fun questions some of them are a little deep but <coughs> they're all gonna be interesting all right given the choice of anyone in the world from any time period who would you want as a dinner guest and why well that's a that's a great one um, you know, I would, uh, I think I'd, I'd love to sit down with, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln. How about that? Yeah. You know, I know he's a fan of yours as well. You're a fan of his. Um, you know, he lived and faced some of the most, uh, in, intense, compelling challenges that our country ever, uh, faced, particularly with uh, slavery and trying to make America you know, a, a great country, um, and to be able to sit down and, and learn from him and spend mm-hmm. some time with him, I think would be would be pretty amazing. There are lots of people I'd love to meet, but I think if I had to pick one, it would yeah. Be him. Um, one of the reasons why I have his him tattooed on my arm um, is the man's resolve and his um, his ability to keep going. Because if you read his history, he had a lot of. Uh, a lot of downfalls. He a lot of tragedies did happen to him. He failed a lot. He felt he failed a, a great number of times, especially when he ran for the Senate, representative. People called him uh people call him a stupid aide, they call him an idiot. And he and he's considered one of the greatest uh leaders in the world. One of the greatest history figures in the world and it just shows like what well, what you can do if you keep going, persevere and keep learning. I think that is a, that's a true statement. I certainly don't compare myself to Abraham Lincoln, but perseverance was really, I would say, one of the one of the things that has enabled um, the 
successes and accomplishments that I've been able to, you know, foster during my time. And certainly at the distillery and um, businesses that I run and organizations I've been involved with, it's like you have to overcome objections. And mm -hmm. what I would tell anybody out there, particularly younger listeners, is that if you want to be successful, um, you know, you, you have to find ways to problem solve and, and uh, overcome objections, whatever they may be. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you see a wall in front of you, you got to go over it, you have to go around it, you have to go underneath it, sometimes you have to go through it. But the point is, don't quit, you know, and particularly if you really believe in something, um, you know, go, 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 don't, do not quit because quitters, uh, or I hate to use that term, I don't like labels, but people who give up easily often don't, uh, they don't, they don't have the, they don't, they don't experience the, the real sort of successes and accomplishments knowing that, you know, you're able to achieve something um, that somebody else did. I, I feel one of my favorite sort of inner um, joys I get at the distillery is I, so many local people in St. Augustine will come up and say, well, I was going to do this with that building. I was going to do that with that building. And I love to hear what their ideas were. Um, but to know that, that I was, you know, a leader and part of the team that was able to actually get that building back into service and do that was, mm -hmm. was something I'm, um, I'm extremely proud of, but, um, yeah, perseverance is a big one. So yeah, I'm with you. What would constitute a perfect day for you? Um, I would say, uh, you know, getting up, uh, pain free, <laughs> the older you get, you realize sometimes saying ache. Um, yeah, I'm getting that right now. <laughs> finding peace and solitude, whether it's through your church or taking a walk on the beach or um, spending time uh, in, a, in nature, whatever, whatever, wherever you can find your solitude. Um, having a chance to uh, spend as much time with the person you love the most. I mean, surrounding yourself for me, it's surrounding myself and my family. I love my children. And, um, as they grow older, they often, well, they've, they've moved away. And so we don't get that much face time with them. But, uh, to me, a, a perfect day would be able to do those things that I already mentioned and then spend just the day with the kids playing music, uh, maybe writing some songs, playing games, cooking, eating, uh, gardening, just, just doing things that, you know, that are, relaxed and, and uh, spending time together. It's really important to us. It's, I have many perfect days, but that would be probably a good one. All right. oh, that's nice. All right, this is a little fun one. Okay. If you wake up tomorrow and gain any power or ability, what would it be and why? Um, if I could gain a power or ability, and what would it be and why? Um, I mean, on some level, if I could have the power to get people to open their minds and be more tolerant of other people's opinions, um, I think if you could somehow wave a magic wand and let people all of a sudden not be so, uh, you know, opinionated about a particular thing. Um, you and I were talking earlier about how div divisive our current world is, particularly in the United States. We were, we're seeing things in left and right and black and white. And uh, I think we need more tolerance. I think we need more empathy. So if I could somehow find a way to help people become more um, uh, empathetic, more open-minded, um, and not be so judgmental, um, and accept people for who they are, whether it's their beliefs or whether it's their opinions or uh, race, color, creed, whatever those things, and people were a little bit more tolerant. I, th I think the world would maybe be maybe just less dark because right now there's some dark stuff out there. Yeah. Um, one thing I kind of remind myself, too, is um, you know, there's dark times these are when heroes are born mm -hmm. that you can't you can't have the dark times without the heroes mm -hmm. so they're out there you just have to be tolerant and listen to them because they, 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 they may not be the person you think they are mm -hmm. alright 
this one is a little personal, so hopefully you like this one, but it's not too bad. When was the first time you fell in love, and how did it happen? Um, well, I mean, I guess I fell in love with my mom. I guess if that, if that qualifies, because <laughs> she would be the first person that I really loved, because she was my caretaker and caregiver. So answering it in literal term, I would say that if you're talking about a, a romantic, you know, as we think of as in our adolescence, um, uh, I think I was 14 or 15 mm. and I was dating a young woman and um, might have been more infatuation than love. But, um, you know, we <laughs> dated and uh, we, we dated for summer and it was I was, I said, I think 14 or 15. I was in Connecticut where I grew up. And, uh, you know, it was wonderful. Hmm. Yeah. My, and the first love's always, always a little bit more, uh, a little more intense. Mm hmm For sure. What are you proud of, but never had an excuse to talk about it? Never had an excuse to talk about it. Um... Um, I'm extremely proud of um, my wife and my kids mm -hmm. and the amazing people that they've become. I don't like to boast about them. It's not my nature. Um, I'm very proud of them. But I would say my wife and my kids and their accomplishments, both as individuals and the people that become... Uh, whether it's through their art or their theater or their song or creative elements or just the great people that they've become, I would say I'm extremely proud of that. Mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how that feels. I don't have a wife or a kid, so it's like, yeah, I'm still single. <laughs> mm. What is your most treasured memory? Um, you know, I, I think probably 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, when uh, all the kids were, I would say, between the ages of 2 and 10, and we would have these, you know, wonderful, you know, sort of winter Christmas mornings uh, where everybody was all together and just the wonderment of the holidays. Um, and the innocence of the children before they were adolescents and before they turned into adults. And there was just this pure, innocent time. Um, we would play games. We would read Harry Potter. We would do all these cool things just together as a family. And, and I think, I, for me, that period of time when they were still... Old, they were old enough to kind of engage in play games and have fun with, but they weren't yet into that kind of teenage angst years. And then they go through, you know, they become young adults and then adults. And now, yeah, they're full on. They're all adults. Our oldest is 33 and our youngest is 25. Mm. Um, and so that innocence in that time period when, um, you know, that we were just this one little family unit together was really, I would say, one of my most, I, you know, I treasure all of our time with him, but if I had to pick one, I would say it was probably that. Okay. And you mentioned Christmas, and when you were describing it, I was remembering my childhood. Like, um, well, I was in New York when we had Christmas, a small apartment in Brooklyn. Nice. Um, what is the biggest sacrifice you made in your life? I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I, I look at most of the things that I've done as things that I've wanted to do and been fortunate enough to do them out of love or, you know, hope or kindness or empathy, um, and I don't even like to use the word sacrifice because then it feels like I, I don't know how to explain it. Um, 
We've given a lot of money to individuals and organizations mm-hmm. and help things move along and stuff. And you could interpret that as saying, well, I don't have that asset now. I, I don't have those dollars now because I gave them away and that mm-hmm. was a sacrifice. But I don't look at it that way. I look at it as something that I chose to do at that time and wanted to do. And I've never looked back thinking I shouldn't have done that. Um, and I certainly, you know, I don't, I know it sounds, oh, it doesn't come across the wrong way, but I don't, no, it's I, don't not. Feel, I don't feel, I don't, I don't like to use that word simply mm. because I feel like the choices that I've tried to make to better myself or better my family or better for my community have been by will versus um, doing this and in exchange I'm therefore not doing that. Sacrifice to me in in furs. Uh, I try and teach this concept to my children. I said at economics long ago, but there's this concept called opportunity cost and opportunity mm-hmm. cost is is a term in economics that basically says it's the thing that you give up doing in order to do something else, right? Yeah. So let's say it's Friday night. You're going to go on a date with your girlfriend, and you have two choices. You can go to the movies, or you could go out dancing. Well, the opportunity cost to go out dancing is you didn't get to the movies, right? It's the thing that you give up to do something else. So even though there's, I could certainly point to and cite a number of things that I gave up, um, I don't look at them as sacrifices or a negative way. I, I, I'm not really not explaining myself very well. But I no, you are. Um, you're not the first person who actually, um, so like on the podcast, I, I can't remember an exact episode, but um, you know, the person said something similar to what you're saying. Like they did things that costed them, but it didn't feel like they were without love. It's not. It's not our regret. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I mean, honestly, I've never. These are great questions, Frank. I never, um, I never looked at that, and I try not to look back. I mean, the thing is, sometimes you'll oh, I should buy it, but I only kept that thing, or I didn't sell it then, or I didn't blah blah. It's like it's in the past, and you can angst over what happened in the past, but there's nothing you can really do about it, and it's it's just kind of a negative place to go. So you know, accept the choices you make. You know. Take the risks, um, learn from them. That's a big one I would offer anybody yep. out there, right? Try not to mistake them, you know, to, to repeat those mistakes rather, and uh, and go forward and, and continue to follow your moral compass of doing the right thing. Yeah, um, what was a big one too? Um, something I have to remind myself and I tell other people: um, part of growth is uh, being um, very honest with yourself and looking at your mistakes. Like you, nobody's perfect, and you're and you're human. You're allowed to make mistakes, as long as it's not the big mistakes, like the moral ones. But you want to make mistakes, and you know, being able to actually look yourself in the mirror and say, like, "All right, I'm responsible for this." That's how you grow. I think the, there's a couple other elements of that I would agree with that fully. Mm-hmm. I think the other thing, and the older I get, um, the more I understand the importance of forgiveness. Mm. It's really important that, um, you know, I don't consider myself a really, really religious or faith-based person, but some of the absolute lessons we get from, you know, the most basic things, whether it's the Lord's Prayer or Hail Mary, some of the things, I mean, it contains language in there that's so essential that we have to, you know, forgive yourself as you forgive others. I mean, you, we're going to make mistakes. We're human, Right. And so the sooner you can recognize that as long as you understand right from wrong and you recognize that in a moment of weakness, sometimes you're going to make a mistake, as you said, not a moral mistake. Mm-hmm. You're not going to hit a, you know, hit a, a cardinal sin, as it were, right? You're not going to go out and kill somebody. You're not going to go out and knowingly steal from somebody. Or what you, sometimes yeah. in, you're going to make dumb mistakes along the way as a kid, but as long as you learn from them, mm-hmm. you're, going to, you're going to be okay. Um, so forgiveness is a big one. Um, you know, the other thing is, uh, you know, as I said earlier, is, is being there to help other people. I think that's important. Um, there was another thing I was going to say. It just slipped my mind. But it, I, you know, I think forgiveness is a big one, you know, for me and trying to, you know, you know, learn from, learn from your mistakes as well. That's a big one. Okay. 
um, let's remind everyone, there's no right answer, right or wrong answer for these questions. Um, like I said, these are inter- personal questions. Just ask these questions on a date because this is how you really get to know someone. Um, we're not going out tonight. No, we? no, <laughs> you're not my type. <laughs> Wendy, Wendy, you'd, uh, Wendy, you'd come after you. Who's Wendy? That's my wife. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is the last question. This is a question I ask everyone. Okay. And it's a deep question. What is the worst thing you have ever done? And what is the best thing you ever done in your life? The worst thing I've ever done. Um, and the best thing I've ever done. Hmm. I don't know. The worst is kind of a is a uh, I mean, there's, there, you can look at it from a lot of different ways mm-hmm. um, you can look at it from a, a business decision standpoint you can look at it from a uh, an ethical and a moral choice you made maybe a lie to somebody mm-hmm. you did something you know that broke one of those things um, and the best thing could be just you know making a choice of taking a risk um the worst thing I've ever done um you know, I, I I don't think it's a single thing that I did, but I think it's a misgiving that I have is I didn't spend more time um, talking to my parents mm. you know, when I had the time with them. I don't know if I would say it was the worst thing that I did, but I would say... That, it's just all based on what you what you feel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I, I wish that I had had not squandered some of the time that I had with my parents. Both mm-hmm. my, dad, my dad died when I was very young. I, he was... Um, I was 21 years old. He had lymphoma and died at a, at a early age. And I was in college. And I was, he was in Florida. I was in, in New England. And it was easier to stay away from him because I was dealing with a sick and dying man and didn't know how to deal with it. And if I had been less fearful and older and more mature, I would have recognized that the time is ticking and spend the time with a person regardless of the fear or the unknown or just the, 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 the uneasy, you know, the, the, the sort of uneasy feelings you had dealing with somebody who's dying. And it's, it's something that's very weird because we're not, we're not hardwired to be around death. I mean, death is something that often in life, you know, we, we fear, we shun, we don't mm-hmm. we put it away. So um, I would say the worst thing that I've ever, that I did maybe was not spending enough time with my dad um, when, uh, when he was, um, when he was ill. And um, I would say that that was that. Um, the best thing or the best choice, the best thing I ever made, um, you know, I would say for sure was um, making a decision to to date and, and go after and <laughs> pursue my beautiful wife. We've been together 35 years. We dated three years before that. Um, we've been really lucky to have the time that we've had together. We have raised um, four beautiful children mm. who were amazing individuals and uh, made lots of friends and we've um, had good health and, you know, done some pretty cool things together, traveled and I think the, the best thing I did was to uh, was to accept the, the, the path that I had to be with her and I would say that was by far the best thing I did. No, I envy, uh, cause I'm looking for that. And sometimes it's really hard. And I think it's hard for everyone, no matter what the generation or what the circumstances are. It's hard finding, uh, that love. And I think we, I think recently there's more, there's been more of a cynical look towards it. Like, oh, it's just, uh, you know, look, true love doesn't exist. Or it's a bunch of emotions or it's just a bunch of chemicals in your head. But you know, nice hearing stories that are that does exist. That there are such things as you want to be with someone for the rest of your life, and that love is there. Yeah, I mean, I think it is a um, you know relationships are really the foundation for love, right? I mean, and so you know, you're you're looking for a companion, uh, a woman who is um, who's going to 
ultimately be there for you if you listen to the wedding vows, right? Mm-hmm. You know, to have and hold, to sickness and in health, um, being there for one another, helping them when they need help, uh, being down. Um, my brother Gary gave me some really, really good advice before I got married. I had asked him, he had been married 10 years longer than I, and I said, Gary, what's the key to success? You and Muriel had been married for 10 years at that point. They, met. they just celebrated their 40th or their 50th. They've been around a long time. Great people. And I said, what's the key? And he said, uh, I thought about it for a second. He's a really smart guy. And he said, you know, he said, both parties need to be willing to give 60%. Mm-hmm. Like, Gary, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. 50, 50. <laughs> he said, hang on there, buddy. Let me explain. It's 60% each. Mm-hmm. And I said, how is that? And that doesn't add up. And he says, yeah, it will. Listen. He said, there can be days when you come home from work and I come home from work. And you've had a bad day, and i got to be there to pick you up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Got it. There are going to be days I'm going to come home from work. You're going to come home from work. I had a bad day, and I've had a bad day. you got to be there to pick me up. I said, yeah, 50-50. He said, hold on. We're not done yet. He said, then there are going to be those days when you come home, and you've had a bad day, and I've had a bad day. And both of you in that moment need to kind of look inside and say, Who's had a shittier day? And if the answer is you, I need to put my crap aside and say, I may have had a bad day, but they've had a worse day. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be there to take care of them. Listen to them. Empathize with them. Find out what's going on. Help them get through whatever they're struggling with. And conversely, you as my partner need to be able to do the same thing for me. Mm -hmm. And if you find a person with whom both are willing and able to to give that extra 10%, to sacrifice that little bit daily, then you have a chance of making it in a relationship. And that only comes from trust, and it comes from you know, respect, and, and certainly love, and attraction. And they all work mm-hmm. together. Um, the other thing, piece of advice I would give you, as a you know, as relationship-based, and this came from my beautiful wife, um, at the end of the day, you have to be willing to talk to each other at mm. least once a day. So, well, I'll tell you a true story. I, we had been, I think we were married maybe a year, still living together, but not married. I can't remember. And um, I had come home from work and I was upset about something and I was kind of all wrapped up. And we'd been dating for a while. So the initial sort of amorous sort of you know, early phases of love had already passed and we were, we were, you know, now working through our relationships and, you know, married. And she sat me down and she said, look, this is like the third day in a row you've come home all wound up and you're not talking about it. Here's the deal, Charlie. <laughs> if you don't tell me what's going on and we don't talk every day about what's going on with you and I see you all upset, mm-hmm. I'm going to think it's about us. Um... And then I'm going to grow uncertain as to whether or not we're still okay together. So you've got to be willing to commit and I'll do the same thing, but you have to be willing to commit whether it's in bed when you wake up in the morning and you're still talking before you've gotten up and had breakfast or if it's, you know, during dinner and you come home from work and you're kind of wrapped around the axle, you got to be willing to tell me what's going on with your day. Cause if you do that, then I'll know it's about something else and that we're still solid. But if I don't know that and you don't talk to me, I'm going to assume that maybe it's something about us. I'm going to grow insecure about you and me mm-hmm. and it, our relationship won't work. Plus, I don't want to be around somebody who doesn't tell me, you know, what's yeah. going on in their lives. So it was a, and I think I was 23 or 24 at the time, but it was that momentary aha, right? That aha moment where I was like, oh God, that, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And ever since then, every day we talk to each other and, and it, and I'm not saying that that's the only reason that it worked, but, you know, relationships take work. I mean, you, they, they, you have to make sacrifices. Mm. You have to often do things that you don't want to do because that's what your partner wants or needs, vice versa. Um, and both parties need to be willing to do that. And it, and it takes work. It takes commitment. Um, there could be times when life's great and groovy and you're all hot to trot and lovey-dovey, and then there are going to be times when, you know, maybe one of you is sick and you got to be there for the other person or maybe that initial bloom has fallen off the rose and you're going to have to work at finding out 
you know what what make that per what makes that person tick. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's about being together and it's about companionship. Because you get older, you know, and you realize you go through this life cycle when you're alone and you're together. And if you're lucky, you're together and you're married. Mm-hmm. And if you're more lucky, you're together, married, and you have a child and one child and you raise them. And there's this life cycle of responsibility that goes through all that. But throughout that, you got to be there, you know, for each other. You have to really want to be there. Um, and, you know, that, that they, the word love, you know, I think in that naturally... Um, embodies the idea that you want to do something for someone else selflessly, selflessly, selfishly, right? Without 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 expecting anything in return, you're doing it because you want to help that person because you care so much about that person. You want to see them get what they want, and if you're both willing to do that, and that it transcends the the couple's relationship. Hopefully, in life, we do that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if we can all be more like that, I think we'll be okay. But it's wanting to help the other person succeed and being willing to do a sacrifice, right? Give something up to get there. So. Yeah, we, um, to end, well, to add to that and end with that, um, we weren't meant to be alone. We're, um, humans, man, mankind, we're social creatures. And we, and plus, like, and straight, gay, whatever. You know, you, you, you can't go through this life alone. You know, you, just, you need to find someone and, um, for the good times and the bad times because you need someone, uh, take it for someone that went through a lot of bad things. I had to, uh, do it by myself sometimes. Not, not totally by myself, but there are times I wish I had someone to talk to and, then, uh, there's really good times. So I wish, uh, I could share it with someone. Mm-hmm. I love to travel. Most of the time, I travel by myself. And uh, a good example, um, and because I know you got stuff to do, um, and when I went to Florence, Italy, I was at this uh, beautiful bed, uh, bed and breakfast mm-hmm. overlooking the town. You saw the, the mountain, not the mountains, but the hills in the background. It's a beautiful, beautiful city. And I was, the room was gorgeous. I got for a great mm-hmm. cheap price. And it was a bittersweet moment because I'm like, man, I can't believe I did this. I've traveled out here by myself. I can't believe I did it. Then that bitter moment came. And like, I wish I'd share that with someone. Sure. But yeah, just uh, going off what you said and going off what I said, um, find someone. Well, keep it. What I would say is keep it open. I mean, I met my wife. We were both coming out of old relationships that neither of us were particularly happy in. Mm-hmm. We never saw it coming. I mean, it was just this kind of natural attraction, and there was something about her that I found appealing, and vice versa. And um, but it happened. We were in this, you know, social setting. It was actually a, a business trade show. And we were across from each other for a couple of days, and it was snowing in Chicago, and it was just the whole story. But the bottom line is that you have to put yourself in situations with other people. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to meet them, whether it's through work or through church or through social organizations or, you know, whatever. And again, I'm, I I don't, I know dating and finding people today is particularly difficult. Um, But the thing is, you got to keep it. You know, you got to keep an open mind to it. and be willing to take risks like mm-hmm. anything else in life, right? Um, and my brother Gary used to say, "You got to kiss a lot of frogs to get the handsome prince, right?" So you got to go out there and you know and try and get on the horse, and mm-hmm. you, you'll find the right person. They'll come along. Just keep an open mind. Yeah, and uh, the mistakes will make you better if you take them take them as lessons. Well, again, more than anything else, you know, be respectful. Um, you know, keep an open mind, and you know, try and be honest with yourself in terms of what you, you know, what your sensibilities are, what do you like, you know, and, and what, what kind of makes you happy, you know, if you love just sitting around a fire and just, you know, chilling out, playing music, and that's what makes you happy, awesome, mm-hmm. you know, right or wrong on that, if you're like, hey man, I want to go out and raise hell and party and go crazy, nothing wrong with that either, obviously, be safe and responsible, 
but there's no right or wrong answer. But, you know, some people are natural extroverts. They just love to be out of mm-hmm. attention. They love being in social situations. And other people are like, I am very happy just sitting in my living room reading a book and, you know, talking to my kids once a day and life's good. Mm-hmm. So it just depends on your, you know, your, your tolerance for, uh, uh, you know, for, for just the being around other people and all that stuff. But just take some chances. You'll find somebody. Hang in there. Take some chances. Okay. So, um, give me your, uh, tell everyone your website, any social media you have for the distillery. Yeah, so um, our website is uh, www.staugustinedistillery.com. Uh, we're available if you just Google us, you'll find us as well on um, on uh, Instagram and uh, Twitter. Um, and I think those are the main channels that we're on right now. But um, um, Facebook is usually pretty active. We're updating stuff that we're doing daily or every other day. And Instagram, we've got some beautiful photographs of the distillery and the products and what we're making there. But, um, you know, most importantly, you know, come by the distillery. It's at 112 Riberia Street. It's right in the heart of downtown St. Augustine. It's just around the corner from Flagler College uh, and uh, right around the corner from San Sebastian Winery. Uh, It's in the same building as the Ice Plant Barn Restaurant. If you've been there, come Mm -hmm. over for a tour. Um, You know, taste some of the most, uh, we think, spectacular, delicious spirits that uh, that you're going to find anywhere in the southeast, you know, being made right in that building. So we invite people to come and learn and try and taste what we do and Give the gift of, of local uh, wherever you can and enjoy it. Okay. I'll put um, the description, I'll put the contact information in the episode for the website and the Instagram, and the Twitter too. Um, thank you guys for listening. Thank you again for doing the episode. I really appreciate My it. Pleasure. Thank you, friend. A lot to take in. It was really good. Um, check out the website, ataboolife.com, where you can get other episodes of the podcast. Uh, articles or stories some poems on there because i am that sappy but all of it's good so check out the website ataboolife.com all right guys have a great week and uh enjoy your life